With mysticism, what we have to remember is mysticism is the experience or the discipline towards an experience of the ultimate reality, the ultimate ground of being that cannot be described. It's more by direct um, experience of, of ultimate reality. And there's many forms of it. There's devotional forms, there's action, you know, karmic forms of it. There's intellectual forms like jnana yoga. Um, Kabbalah is a very, very intellectual abstract form of mysticism that involves a lot of juggling of ideas. And it's very philosophical. There's lots of symbols. It's very deep. It's like learning the code of the matrix. The biggest thing to understand with this is that Kabbalah, like all mysticism, is drawing a bridge metaphorically, um, cognitively, or through some sort of method. It creates a bridge between this moment and this experience and the source of all reality or the ultimate reality. So you might say God or Brahman or whatever. And that's pretty ambitious, but I think it's the coolest thing to do. Because in so doing, you'll ultimately end suffering and experience complete ecstasy. And what's cool about mystics is when you read the, the contributions of mystics, they sound insane a little bit, but they all sound the same. When you get to the core of the mystical tradition, you start reading it and know it, whether it's the the, or the pre-Socratic uh, philosophers, if it's the Kabbalists, if it's the, um, if it's the Sufis, they all have their different means and methods and they all have their different styles. But once you get to the core, there's this beautiful paradox that they all express. And you can like, you can feel the passion when you read them. And it's like, I, f I don't know, I find it's so, it's, it's so, so relatable. Like it's really cool. So, um, <clears throat> So we have to understand that what we're working is in, in we are bringing together a contradiction and the, and the big contradiction in all forms of mysticism is I'm going to I'm going to do a little experiment with you guys. You can find the edges of your body, right? Can everyone find the edges of their body? If you can measure, let's say measure, you can measure one side of your body to another. Everyone can do that, right? Right. In, in any axis, let's say you measure the top of your head to your feet from finger to finger, there's a finite distance in the body. Now try to measure the mind, right? Can anyone find the distance in the mind? If you can, let me know, because I would love to hear it. Let me check chat. So when you measure the mind, you notice that you can't measure the mind. So it is this very existential contradiction that I find that begs the question that starts the mystical discipline. Why is there an experience of a finite reality, yet there is an intuitive sense of an infinite reality? How can that be? Um, or another one that, another way to phrase that question is, why is there an internal world separate from an external world? Why is there here separate from here? Uh, and Kabbalah and mysticism starts to unravel that. Um, literally, the, the fundamental of the fundamental separation between where you start versus where you end and where the world begins starts to dissolve in um, in the highest forms of mysticism. Uh, Q for Joe. How can people use this knowledge for their everyday life? Kabbalah tends to polarize tarot novices. I find that challenging to convey. Great question. So, for everyday life. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say I'm gonna say something bold, but first I'm gonna say something more practical. Um, in studying the Kabbalah with tarot, it adds a dimension of organization of ideas, and I find that it makes it brings tarot from a linear um, spiritual device that shows you card by card from A to B into more of an all at once technology where you can start to see all the cards relate to each other uh, in a in a faster way and in a more holistic way, where the tarot starts to represent a living, breathing reality, as opposed to like snapshots of experiences. Um, and for reading the tarot, having something like the Kabbalah and the Tree of Life helps you organize your information about the cards. That was probably the most practical. And it, it's, it's, it's an easier way to learn why they mean what they mean and, um, and their relationship with each other. Uh, same for astrology. Now, for everyday life, I would argue, and this is just my bold, my bold argument, I would argue that studying something like Kabbalah, which is so lofty, 
can have the potential to completely change your paradigm of how you view, to, view the world and yourself. And in so doing, bring so much joy and even ecstasy into your world. And uh, that to me is the most practical thing ever for me. Now, I'm not saying everyone has to have that same goal, but, but, um, but yeah. And it, it starts to not only uh, help you organize the information in the tarot, but when you work with people, like when you're working on helping somebody, healing somebody, giving somebody information, operating from a from um, a paradigm that can arise from studying Kabbalah, can can bring you to new heights of personal awareness and existential awareness. That um, it's it's it would be like the, it's it's very similar to like studying yoga or working with like you know an Eastern mystical tradition. It just it gets you to remove sl- start to remove yourself from what you think you are and embody what you really are and in so doing it's freaking awesome that's my my bold ass claim <laughs> and i what i would do is uh thank you ryan i would echo lon model duque and saying that cabal is something you build up inside you so my cabal has been cooking for a while and i'm very happy with it but it's not, it doesn't have to be exactly your Kabbalah. In the same way that my tarot is not going to be your tarot, right? You have your own mind, your own lived experience, um, your own way of thinking. And so however this lands is how it's going to land. But I find that for me, when I started learning Kabbalah with tarot, oh my God, talk about a singularity. It was like, it completely changed the game. Because it, it, it went, tarot went from a, a thing that I was using to help myself and others to a thing that I was using to know myself and others, like, and not know in a sense of like cognitively, oh, I can conceptualize me. It's like, oh my God, I am the universe and the universe is me and the universe is you too. So why are we suffering and shit? What is our problem? Everything's fine. I'm not saying that's how it is all the time, but it can bring you to those really awesome moments. Um, Okay. So, yeah, and, and another, one last thing I wanna say is when we study this, again, the, ex, the, the mystical experience, which is at the core of all this stuff is the same everywhere, ish. Well, it's not the same everywhere. There's various types of experiences, but I find that the core truth that people are talking about are the same. Uh, but the way that you, it is expressed, you will also find it as similar. So if, if you're someone here that does Reiki or you're interested in like the chakra system or you've worked in some other traditions, you're gonna see parallels and, uh, play with those parallels, you know, like, because, because they exist, because ultimately we're, the inquiry that we are uh, um, attempting to do is with Kabbalah and tarot is the same inquiry that the yogis and the, and everyone has been doing. Um, So we're kind of working with the same blank canvas, you know, Um, we're just painting different things, but it's all on the same canvas. Okay. So, so, we're looking with Kabbalah to to build a bridge between to build a bridge between the above and the below, and to use hermetic words, the above and the below. The above being the source of creation in the universe, and the below being this reality as we experience it in our bodies, in our lives, in all of that, in the world of time. And uh, and the road between the two is represented by the tree of life. Now, what's cool here is the tree of life. So that there's a duality here. You know what? I should talk about gender for a moment. I'm just going to talk about it because it's important. Um, gender is a little bit important, kind of. I don't know who you ask. Some people <laughs> try to knock me for knocking gender, but it's I do it for a specific reason. Um, before you start talking about gender in this way, I find that gender is used in, in other ways, which is totally fine in esotericism and spirituality. It isn't until you conceptualize gender in, in this way that I find that it really takes off. And so that's why I tend to knock gender until I reach Kabbalah, until I start talking about Kabbalah and this level of, of working with tarot and esoterica. So when you look at all these mystical traditions, you do find a duality. And the duality is, is, is very much expressed with gender but this is like the highest duality before the unity. And the duality is masculine, obviously masculine and feminine. Um, but you know, historically, you have females with childbirth becoming associated with form. They're associated with form because they bring form. They, they birth children and children are form. They birth consciousness into form, right? So historically we associate that with form and, um, 
in some ways matter and in some ways um, that, okay? I'm just gonna use the word form. That the opposite to that on the masculine end um, in the procreative process, um, various civilizations would see the, the masculine influence as invisible, right? You don't really see that part often, <laughs> right? So because of that, the masculine archetype has been associated with an invisible aspect of reality where, you know, uh, males don't produce children. And females have been associated with the visible and experienceable aspect of reality. So because of that, that's the big duality here, because the masculine is this invisible aspect and the feminine is this visible aspect. So when we, when we bring this into the tree of life and into the mystical pursuit, what we're looking at is the division between the world that can be experienced. And I'm gonna say the world of objects. Now objects include body, it includes thoughts as well. It includes words, it includes anything that you can experience. You experience a thought, you experience your body, you experience other people, places and things. Anything that is an object, that is represented by the sacred feminine, the mother. Everything, the, the, now the, the, the next step is that which is observing all of those objects, the, the pure consciousness itself, which is not an object because it is what is observing all those objects, that is expressed by the sacred masculine, okay? Now, that's just how it developed in history and how things have been expressed mythologically. And it's not to say you have to own, you, you have to learn these archetypes and make them part of your paradigm, it's up to you. But that's, that is why we have the feminine as represented by the earth and the masculine represented as spirit. And there's probably some sexist influences and misogyny in there as well, but, but at its core, that's why those two became, became a representative of both. So yes, we can take gender and we can do really cool things like have it talk about and hint at sex magic and all of that, but at its core, the fundamental highest expression that that gender is expressed is expressing is the eternal nameless invisible consciousness that is what is allowing everything to be experienced masculine and all of those experiences which is feminine but in the sankhya philosophy this is the philosophy of of patanjali and the yoga sutras this would this might be represented as purusha and prakriti purusha being pure consciousness and prakriti being nature now they exist in that philosophy as dualistic but you know, receiving each other. Um, I find that the highest forms of mysticism um, eventually lead to a non-dual state where the observer and the observer, the subject, the consciousness through which everything is being experienced and all of the, the world of experiences, the masculine and the feminine, when they are merged, there's only a non-dual state. And the problem with the non-dual state is it is you can't describe it. It's ineffable. And it's ineffable because language, all language is an object, right? All words are objects. All thoughts are objects to, an, to a subject, right? So if you can't describe it with an object because it's not an object. It is the all pervasive, all encompassing. You can use metaphors, you can use disciplines, you can use meditation techniques, you can use philosophies to suggest it, but you can't directly give it to someone or rather you can't in, in a, in a in, in a colloquial sense. And we're gonna be going through a lot of those philosophies, meditation techniques and uh, sources in mysticism for misfits. So we're gonna cover a whole range of various ways to approach that non-dual state. And, and yeah, the irony is it's not something you approach because it is all things. Anyway, okay. So uh, so this marriage, this, this hermetic marriage between the masculine and the feminine, the subject and the object, the consciousness and that which you are conscious of, they do a little dance. And that dance is the tree of life, or the tree of life at least expresses that dance. And so the, the non-dual ultimate source of all of this uh, is, is above, and the result of all of this is below. And so we have two pillars on the tree of life. Uh, do, do I have any questions so far? I really like, I'm, I'm really trying to lay this foundation before we get even into the tree of life because, because the, the, it just changes the whole thing. Uh, I just want to use, because somebody mentioned social anxiety and anxiety in, in general, another practical use of this is when you study something like Kabbalah and, and I find a lot of 
mysticism, at least the way I've understood it, you begin to recognize, see all of those, whatever that is, anxiety, things, whatever those feelings are, you can be you can observe them, but not be them, right? So we, we always hear like Eckhart Tolle, you're not your body, you're not your mind, right? You're not your thoughts. This philosophy is literally that, and not only that, it, it shows you why you are not your thoughts and how you are not. So, so the more you dive in, the more you start identifying less with the objects of your awareness, which could be the feelings of this or that or anxiety and stuff, and just becoming aware of them. And um, that's ascending the tree of life in, in my mind, or at least a version of it. Um, and that to me is the coolest freaking thing you could do because then you live, that's literally the beginning of ending suffering for me. So I'm really excited for the mysticism, of course. It's going to be so fun. Is there an assumed hierarchy? I realize that 10 goes back to one. There's unity, not separateness, but due to needing to separate for the purpose of conversation is masculine seen as of higher purpose because it needs to come first and therefore patriarchy just thinking, yeah. So is there a hierarchy between masculine and feminine? Where does that fit? Um, some, yeah, maybe some Kabbalists might say yes in a sense, but I would say no. Uh, I would say that in the subject versus object model, I would say not so much that there's a hierarchy and this is where things break down because this is where when you go into the non-dual place after the dual place, the dual place being subject and object, the breakdown is realizing that the, the objects of your experience can only exist because there is a subject. And so it's not as much of a hierarchy as it is a level of scale. And as you start to zoom out from the objects, they all exist in this all pervasive subject. So maybe you might say that the subject is higher up if we were to put it in a model because the subject exists in the, in, in the, ob in the, the, the object exists in the subject, but it's more a, um, in the yoga philosophy, they would say it cancels each other out. Um, but yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. All things must run the instrument known as the mind before conceptualization. We can never know anything. Yeah, totally. Um, absolutely. So the instrumentation is the key word and I don't want to scare anyone away, but it's like everything that we experience, a lot of what we experience goes against these philosophies because a lot of the mystical philosophies, a lot of the deeper sides of the occult completely reverse how you view yourself in the world in reality. Um, complete, that's what the hangman is. It's a complete reversal of what you experience to be true. But your experiences go against that, right? How can we all be one? How can there be non-duality when I'm here on this side of the Zoom and you're there on that side of the Zoom? We have people in the Netherlands, we have people in all over the place around the world. There's clearly separation. The answer to that is that it's in the instrumentation. The instrumentation of knowledge is itself an object of knowledge. But so, and, and that's what, when, when we start doing the, I've done it with some of you, we've done some healing practices, we did the peace process, but that's what the peace process is, is it allows the space of awareness to, you to recognize the space that is awareness and recognize the object that you're experiencing. But in so doing, by not identifying with the object, it does what it needs to do. And that, that to me is the, that's, that's the best hermetic marriage I've ever seen. I mean, you know, I don't know. Healing your shit is freaking awesome to me. I think that's the coolest thing you can do. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, and a lot of this, so, well, another thing that's cool about it is it, it combines this stuff. Once you get close enough, once you go far enough, it's like mysticism, personal development, energy work. It's all the same thing. Um, eventually, eventually. Um, but yeah. Okay. So, so we have this, so we have this duality of subject and object and uh, the way that that dance between subject and object, that the jazz of the universe is expressed in the tree of life. So let's say I have the subject on my right hand and the object on my left hand, and we go back and forth and we create a universe like this. It's all polarity. So there's, there's some cool things that happen. The pillar of mercy shows us this masculine pillar, which is generally a, a pillar of um, adding things, expansion, and uh, maybe we might say the positive charge, um, but not just, not good necessarily, just um, confer confirming and um, yeah, allowing, merciful, 
loving. Um, it's the easy path. It's the fun path. It's a pleasurable path. And then the left side, we have the pillar of severity, which is the opposite of that, which is the, the if, if the right side is contractive, the pillar of mercy, the pillar of severity is, uh, I'm sorry, if the right side is expansive, the pillar of severity is contractive. And through that contraction, it creates form. So I, I like to use the word force and form, force for the uh, masculine pillar and form for the feminine pillar. And the forming agent is one of discrimination and or discernment and separation and limitation, because without limitation, there would not be uh, formulated things to dance around in the phantom show of time and space. There wouldn't be us, right? If we didn't, if our bodies didn't have a beginning and an end, where would we, we wouldn't be a thing separate from anything else, okay? So the pillar of severity comes in and allows for us to experience ourselves or experience this truth in all these various ways in lives and even in our thought and in, in everything, there's a balance here. So these 10 spheres, these 10 sephiro, the best way to um, look at this is it's as if the ultimate ground of being, the ultimate mystery, the divine God source, if, if that was poured into this first circle, as if, let, let's look at them as vessels. If number one, Keter, the first Sephira, if this was a vessel, it would receive the waters of consciousness of the divine. Well, I'm going to use the word consciousness. And let's say consciousness fills up number one, and then it overflows number one and fills up number two. And then it overflows number two, fills up number three. And then it overflows, fills up number four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And as this flow of consciousness reaches um, new vessels, new vessels and new things are created. But it's important to know that it keeps going between the extremes. So the extremes here, it's kind of like a pinball game, you know? You, you play the pin, you get, the, the only way you can play the pinball game is if you have borders for it to, to bounce around from, you know? If one side is broken open, you don't have a side of the pinball game, that ball's gonna get lost. There's gonna be no game, right? So the, the tree of life is like this pinball game through which the ball bounces between, ext between extremes. Um, those extremes being expansion and contraction ultimately. And each of these spheres have different qualities. So we have the horizontal dimension, which I'm going to, in my heretical approach to the Kabbalah, I would say that it's between subject and object, consciousness and object of, and experience. Um, but you can also say masculine, feminine, or you could just say traditionally mercy and severity. And then besides the horizontal dimension, we have the vertical dimension of the tree, which runs between the beginning, the source, or the absolute, and the bottom, number 10, which is the manifest world that we experience. And this is how we build the bridge. Um, let me check questions before I keep going. Um, why does the male symbol appear on the feminine pillar and vice versa? Are mercy and victory considered male and severity considered female due to their pillars? Great question. So um, um, the Hermetic Kabbalah, at least, and I think probably Jewish Kabbalah too, but definitely Hermetic Kabbalah, the genders change, uh, it come, it, they intertwine. So whereas Hokma in number two is purely masculine and Bina in, um, in the sphere three and sphere three is, is purely feminine, four, uh, Hesed is masculine, but with feminine qualities. Um, and Gebora is feminine, but with masculine qualities. And then we keep, keep going at number seven, uh, Victory Netzah is feminine with masculine qualities and Hode in number eight is masculine with feminine qualities. So they interchange as they go. Uh, how do you find become aware of your footing position on the tree? Or is it always assumed that you initiate at Malkut? I love that question. This is a good one. And you know what? This is a very subjective question. So I have to make that disclaimer, um, but it depends on who you ask. And ultimately it's, it's only you can tell because no one's having your subjective experience at any one time. Now, that said, if you go to an esoteric order, they'd probably have a lot of things to say about how I'm teaching this. And that's totally cool because you can, that's, that's fine. And if you go to an esoteric order, like something like the Golden Dawn or the OTO or um, the AA, they have an entire grading system where when you enter, you become initiated and you essentially start on the bottom of the tree and work your way up. 
and each grade is associated with one of these spheres on the tree of life. So technically you would be in whatever sphere you are in whatever grade you are. Now, it doesn't take a whole lot of research of history to see that these grading systems have not really worked out for a whole lot of groups uh, all the time. Some of them do. I'm not, I'm not trying to shit on them. I'm just saying to, to be aware of some of them are great. I've met some amazing people that run these things and they're amazing. And, you know, there's also people that aren't amazing in these things. So, so that's one way um, to go through a grading system. Or you can, another way is you can, if you are approaching it magically, you can you can just, you know, download the PDFs of whatever system you want to go through and then do that, right? So like the Golden Dawn material is all published. Uh, Israel Regardi published the book called The Golden Dawn, which is the entire system, maybe more or less, maybe there's hidden stuff, I don't know. But you can follow that and do all the initiations yourself if you want. I actually asked somebody a similar question. I asked somebody, what do you think that the, the tree of life is equal to all the experience, like, do you think it can represent the growth and shift and spiritual progress of all forms of mystic sages, whatever, like, you know, does the, did the Dalai Lama go through the tree of life? And somebody said, yeah, probably being that it's, you know, kind of a universal template for ascending into some level of spiritual awareness, probably you can totally correlate those experiences. And I would probably agree. Um, but in terms of like where you are at any given moment, that's a very hard question to say, but I would say that, um, I would, I would say that when you have, having certain experiences, you can see more easily how the tree of life expresses mm, um, signposts of those experiences and, and aspects of those experiences, um, especially in, in, in realms of, yeah, it, it just, it, it allows, it's like a map. So you can see, oh, my thoughts were here, but my feelings were here, but my body was here, but you know, the, the, the reality was here. You can start to map things like that on the tree of life. Um, but I would also argue that the tree of life is not this necessarily, it's not necessarily this, um, let, me, let me pull the tree up again. I would argue that the tree of life is not necessarily a hopscotching system where you literally take your entire self and you leave Malkuth at the bottom in the physical world and you go into the subconscious of the of Yesod and then you jump over here and then you jump over here. I, don't, I mean, I don't think you're literally doing that. And I would argue that I don't think you're fully doing it either, but that's just me. You know, someone could say, well, of course, there's a very specific experience and state of consciousness that is associated with Hod and associated with Netzach. And yeah, I think it's much more fluid. Um, yeah. Cool. So uh, in, in connection to tarot, what, what this does is it takes the numbers that you already know from ace through 10, and it expands them now into the tree of life. So now we're not just working with uh, mnemonic memory devices, but we're seeing how each of these numbers and each of the pit cards express a stage in creation. So I just want to reiterate one thing. When we're working with the tree of life above and below, we, it's a two-way street. So when we start above and we go below, we are what the cool kids call manifesting, right? We are creating our world. We are being the magician. We are, um, yeah, we are creating. And when we reverse, 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 when we go from below to above, um, the word I say is ascend, but you can ascending, you are, yeah, you are kind of going not so much manifesting in the outer world, but pulling in and pulling into the inner world more and more until you reach the, the ultimate true absolute ground of being or true nature above. Okay, so there's there's these two streets, two-way street. And the tarot now considering that expresses this two-way street of creation uh, and, and ascent through, throughout all of the, all of the tarot does this. And the way that it does is through the court cards, the, the, the pit cards and the majors. So to use the Thoth deck as an example, so we have these 10 spheres, the, you'll notice that the minor arcana cards are associated with their associated number on the spheres. And so the, all, the four suits of the minor arcana cards um, show a, a creation from ace through 10 of something relevant to the suit. So the suit of fire shows the creation of fire from ace through 10. The suit of water shows the creation of water from ace through 10. Um, so ace through 10 shows the creation of relationship and, and, and emotional reality. Um, 
The sword shows the creation of mind and also the futility and de destruction of mind, that whole journey of mind through the suit of swords. Same with the suit of discs. Um, and uh, the majors, the major arcana, are associated with the paths that connect the sephirot. So if the sephirot are like these major points where the, the source of the universe, the absolute, created all of reality, the, the paths between them are the energies flowing between these, these major points, these major events. And those energies flowing between the numbers are the major arcana cards. So this is why you'll, you'll have some tower readers, the way they teach is they'll, they'll teach like ace is related to the magician and the twos are related to the high priestess. And that's cool. I don't want to knock it. It's totally valid. And there are some cool connections. I just find that the, the deeper approach is to see the major cards on the paths because then you could really get cooking with stuff. Because then when you meditate on the relationships between the aces and all of the threes in the tarot, you get the magus and you get everything that the magus and the magician is associated with. And when you meditate on that, there's like a whole world of possibilities. You start to think about how does the source of the number one become the duality of the number three, which is associated with the sacred feminine and the womb and birth and all these things. And how is that depicted through the magician? It, it gets really fun. All of the cards are running all over the tree of life all the times. They have places where they're most comfortable, just like we do places, you know, and because we're always looking at the tree of life, like the picture here, and it's, it's stopped. It's, it, it's a, a pale comparison to the tapestry of existence and how the threads move through it and they're alive and they change and it, I'm just yeah I think that's it I think that was the whole thought yes um so what and you're bringing me into my favorite place which uh I wasn't gonna there's a contradiction in looking at the fixity of it versus the dynamic nature of reality in the universe and another question is that's kind of like, it's like, where does this, where is this beginning and where is this ending? Like, is this on a timeline? Do we end at Malkuth and then do we go back to Keter? Does, does the universe end in heat death or reabsorb? And those are all cool ways that you can approach it and they're valid. And I, and I sometimes teach it that way. It's like the universe ends, comes back together, another big bang. But the deeper, the deeper way to, to play with this, and I, I'm going to I'm not going to remember the quotes, but I'm going to cite two really cool people uh, that I'm going to bring in in the Mysticism for Misfits course that are just like, one is uh, Jakob Bo Burma. I think that's how you say it. Jakob Boma Burma. I, I just say Jacob Bohm because that's how I read it. But he was a German mystic who wrote some really awesome stuff. And also there's a, um, he was like Renaissance, I think. And then a Middle Ages um, Advaita Vedanta philosopher named Godapada. And what they talk about, they pull back from the universe as being this linear narrative of creation, because the tree of life is showing us the creation of the universe, right? And that's cool. And that's already like deep in itself. But the next stage, the next thing to look at is, well, is it happening right now in this moment? Or is it happening through time? Or like, is it, and they ultimately say that the, the, the general philosophies are level one is like, okay, God, the source created the universe and we are the result. That's a paradigm and that's cool. And if that's your paradigm, it's cool. Level two is kind of like a, a, a lot of Eastern mysticism, Kashmir Shaivism is this is all a dream of God. This is all a dream of the source. And we're all part of that dream, but that dreamer is one. That's level two. Level three destroys all of those. It's very dangerous and very beautiful. And it says, what universe? And it says, the absolute alone, this is the nature of the absolute alone. So it destroys the idea that there is a chronology of, oh, the universe is going to be created. Eventually, it'll be destroyed. It destroys the idea that that the, the source, that God, the absolute needs a dream, because why would the absolute need a dream? Why would it? Need? It's like people say, oh, this is, it's like we have this common idea, and I love this one, of, oh, we're all consciousness experiencing itself because it's fun. And I agree. I totally agree. But the next level to that is what, what experience? The next level to that would be, it's not a dream, it's not experience, it is, this is the nature of that mystery. And so um, in that, when we arrive at that place, the tree of life is destroyed and it becomes, we leave the model behind 
and it, it's just the dynamic of the nature of, of what we're trying to explore. <laughs> um, there's no like model for it. Yeah. So, and that, that then it gets very, now Zen, a Zen master would, would, would take this and be like, what the fuck, stop, stop distracting yourself with the tree of life. They would just hit you with a stick and be like, this is the reality, you know? It's like, it's different approaches, you know? <laughs>